Thank you. Okay. So <clears throat> a little bit about the museum and myself as to why, I mean, I'm invited here to do this uh, talk on Jazz Appreciation Month and why we're even talking about BICS. So uh, the BICS Biobic Museum is located downtown Davenport, down on the corner of 2nd and Main Street. Uh, we're in the River Music Experience Building. We are a 501c nonprofit dedicated to uh, teaching and preserving the life and legacy of Bix Beiderbeck. Um, not only do we have a museum exhibiting uh, a whole exhibit on Bix's life, his career, and the musicians that are, are revolving around him, along with a little bit of Davenport history and early jazz history, uh, we also have the largest archives located in the Davenport Public Library downtown, just two blocks from us, uh, that is used for public use for research and other purposes. And so we are the premier location to learn anything about Bix and a number of other uh, early jazz history items. Um, if you want to know more about the museum or you like what we're talking about, you can visit us at bixmuseum.org or uh, you can visit us at our museum. So this talk isn't exactly about Bix's whole life and career. I'm going to be talking more about his childhood and a little bit of Davenport history and a number of other things like that. So I wanted to give a bit of a background on Bix uh, so that people know who he is exactly. So he was born here in Davenport in 1903. He died at the age of 28 in Sunnyside, New York in 1931. He's an early jazz cornetist and pianist, uh, known as one of the most influential jazz soloists of the early jazz era. Um, many consider him on par with the likes of Louis Armstrong uh, for perspective on that. He played with other musicians like Hoagy Carmichael, Eddie Condon, uh, Bing Crosby. Uh, you can probably name about two dozen other musicians, but that kind of gives you an example of who he was playing with. He composed a number of things, uh, four of them being piano pieces. The two most important uh, compositions of him is Davenport Blues, which he composed here in Davenport at his parents' house, and In a Mist, which is a piano piece uh, and the only one that he actually uh, recorded himself before his death. The other three he didn't get a chance to record. He has three Grammys for the recordings of the song Singing the Blues, In a Mist, and Georgia On My Mind. Uh, Singing the Blues is in the Library of Congress, is considered one of America's uh, substantial recordings of our history in terms of a musical recording. He played In a Mist at Carnegie Hall, and so that can tell you a bit about how important his work has been. Uh, he's in eight Music Hall of Fames. There are 12 books written about him. He's also mentioned in dozens of biographies, uh, two of them being autobiographies of Louis Armstrong and Hoagie Carmichael. And these are important because he is one of the only musicians who has a full chapter dedicated to him in both of those biographies. He has four movies made inspired on his life, uh, one of which was recorded here in Davenport. Uh, in Davenport specifically, uh, there's a street named after him. There are two statues uh, located downtown dedicated to him. There is an annual jazz festival, not only here, uh, but multiple ones across the world that are all dedicated to Bix and his music. There's also a race here in Davenport, the Bix Seven, named after him. Uh, the Bix Bistro in the Black Hawk Hotel, named after him as well. And just a number of other things that um, I don't really have time to rattle off, you know, talking about things that uh, is named after Bix or inspired by Bix. Many musicians to this day uh, cite Bix as one of their biggest influences uh, in, in their life. Now, going into a bit more about the actual topic of tonight, um, one thing that comes up in conversation when people talk about Big Spider Beck is the fact that he grew up in Davenport, Iowa. And people also go, well, why, why Davenport? Why not Chicago or New Orleans or New York? Uh, anywhere else, one of the big cities that uh, most big name jazz musicians are probably from. Uh, and so the question ends up being is, was it a fluke? Did Bix just kind of come out of nowhere and it was just, you know, a happenstance because he was a great musician? Or maybe he grew up in a very good location to become a musician. And so while thinking about it, some of you may think of a few other famous people from the Quad Cities uh, that you may know that kind of have a, a very important impact on uh, history as a whole. Um, and I'm going to give an example of a few who were around Bix's time uh, to the mid 20th century. 
So as this list, we have Hazel Keener, who was a model around Bix's time. She was actually uh, voted uh, the most beautiful woman in America at one point. Uh, Joe Frisco, uh, he is actually very well known in a dancing scene. Uh, he was a comedian and also a uh, actor for a while. Um, most commonly, probably people might know his name from The Great Gatsby. His dancing style was actually mentioned uh, to describe some of the dancers in the book. You have Floretzel von Ruter, who was a child prodigy who was born here, and by the age of seven, he was a professional musician, even conducting his own orchestras. Uh, his career was primarily in Europe, uh, but he grew up here in Davenport. You have Pat Patrick, a musician mostly known for working with Prince for many years, and Louis Belson, who is commonly known as the inventor of the double bass pedal uh, drumming technique, which is used by drummers even to this day. So a bit of an idea of what Davenport was like in the early 1900s. Between 1990 and 1920, Davenport was known as the wickedest city in America. Uh, a coin, a term coined by uh, the current bishop in the area, who was the head of St. Ambrose at the time, and it was kind of known almost countrywide about this. Um, but the big thing was its reputation of having all these bars and burlesque clubs always every night. Um, it was said there was anywhere from 500 to 1,000 in operation every single night. And in order for that many bars and clubs and things like that to operate, you kind of needed a lot of musicians to be playing and entertaining people back then. Uh, there was a bustling nightlife. And so there are even just stories of how crazy some of the nightlife has been. I'm sure some people growing up here might know them. A uh, popular destination uh, was this Quad Cities area uh, for a lot of immigrants, especially a large influx of Germans. And so you might know that a lot of the buildings downtown are built by some of these German immigrants. Um, and this was mostly due to the fact that Davenport's location uh, along the Mississippi River was a gateway to the west of Amer Western America. Um, it was also a very nice location for people traveling from the south up north to get to places like Chicago, Detroit, Minneapolis. Um, and it was also kind of a halfway point from St. Louis to Chicago. So a lot of people were traveling through here for one reason or another, and a lot of people stopped here uh, on their path of immigration. It became a large industrial and cultural sector, uh, which shaped the community as to what it is today. Uh, some of the buildings downtown that a lot of people might know is the Call Building, the Black Hawk Hotel, uh, the Davenport Bank and Trust Building, the Capitol Theater, all of those were built in the early 1900s as Bix was growing up. Um, one of the buildings that's kind of important to me uh, is in this photo on the bottom there, and that is the, um, ooh, <laughs> can't believe I forgot the name off the top, but it's the, um, yeah, the RME building, but back then it was, Von Maher. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Yeah, the Von Maher building. Um, Von Maher is still in operation today, but uh, this building still stands and was built during that time period. And so um, it's great to see that the building that our museum is in is, is this historical place that was built when Bix was born. So talking about Bix's family, he was... Oh. One quick thing about that before the wicked city and all those bars is also 1915 was the smallest community to ever have their own symphony orchestra. It's been a, now it's one of the longest continuous symphony orchestras. So we're not all here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, so Jim pointed out that uh, uh, despite being the wickedest city, it was actually one of the uh, smallest cities with a, a national orchestra uh, back in the early 1900s. And it's still in operation today. Uh, actually, talking about that, they recently won an award for one of the top orchestras in the country. So um, that kind of tells you how long that history is. Um, talking a bit about the Biter Bix, Bix is the youngest of two. Uh, he was born from Bismarck and Agatha. Uh, Bix's name was Leon Bismarck Biter Beck, uh, which was shortened to just Bix, uh, about the age of eight or nine, as, as a, a name that they kind of, uh, his father had growing up and they kind of gave it to Bix and he stuck. Um, Bismarck was the manager of the Davenport Field Company and his mother Agatha was an organ player at their church. Uh, his grandparents, Charles and Louise Spiderbeck, were both German immigrants, which made Bix uh, the first born American in his family. His father and mother were both uh, born in Germany before they emigrated. Charles had owned the Spiderbeck Miller grocery store 
Uh, and Louise was also an organ player at the local church. Uh, the big thing about his family were they were very big into the arts. Uh, Charles specifically was on the school board. Uh, he was president of the German Musical Society, a trustee of the public library, and he was the founder and president of the first chartered national bank in Davenport. Uh, a big thing with, with his family, almost everyone knew how to play an instrument. Uh, at family gatherings, as you can see in the bottom photo, uh, they would go to his grandparents' house and all the kids would perform for all of the parents as kind of the entertainment for the night. And it was said that Bix was actually the, uh, since he was the second from the last, he was kind of the, the uh, ending act for the evening and everyone loved him. So talking about Bix a bit as a kid, he went to Tyler School in, in Davenport High School. Uh, Tyler School is now a park, uh, which is actually across the street from where he grew up, where his home is. And Davenport High is uh, now Davenport Central. Uh, it's the same building that has been standing since they opened the building. As a kid, he participated in both theater and all of the music groups. Uh, he played baseball and tennis, a very normal kid. Uh, he had a very fun time, actually a fairly good athlete. He won a few uh, tournaments playing tennis. He was a self-taught musician. Uh, he first learned how to play the cornet in high school. Uh, he was a piano player by the age of three. Uh, he was mostly known as the kid who could uh, hear anything and could immediately play it right after hearing it. And so uh, in a lot of ways, Bix was uh, a savant. He kind of could hear anything and replay it. Um, the best way he learned jazz uh, was when he would listen to a record and primarily it became with a Tiger Rag record that his brother brought back from World War I. And he would listen to it over and over. And then he learned and self-taught himself uh, while messing with the cornet, how to play every different instrument's part. And so he could play every instrument's part on all of these records growing up, uh, just from listening to them. Uh, he kind of made a few bucks here and there uh, growing up during doing this because he would do some performances for his neighbors uh, or guys who were trying to ask a girl out. They would uh, ask Bix to play some music for him. His first gig that he got uh, under his own band was at the Haynes Dancing School uh, in 1921. Um, prior to that, he was still working here and there, playing music in different bands, uh, but this was kind of his first uh, gig before he went on to be more of a professional musician. Uh, he also uh, got by playing piano at the local movie theaters in town, because uh, around that time, they're silent films, and so they would have a band or a pianist playing music uh, over the, the, uh, the videos. Oh, and it's not. Okay. So we talk about Bix being very big on self taught, and for the most part in his life, he is self taught. Um, but he did have a few teachers that influenced him quite a bit. Uh, his early lessons on the piano were from a Charles Grady uh, from Muscatine. Uh, Charles Grady only taught him for a little bit of time. Uh, what happened was his mom had all three of her kids uh, learn the piano. And Grady had come and, and done a few lessons with Bix. Uh, and Bix had, at one point, uh, he would be told to learn some sheet music. And Bix would ask Grady, hey, could you play it real quick before you leave? And Grady would play it. He'd leave. He'd come back. And Bix would then repeat that song to him, uh, note from note, including a couple of mistakes here and there that Grady would do because he was trying to get out of there. Uh, and so Grady caught on that Bix was kind of uh, only listening to what he did and learned basically from here, told his mom, I, I can't keep teaching this kid anything. Um, and, and so he, he moved on and didn't keep teaching him. But uh, Bix had learned uh, a little bit of piano from him early on. While he's in the school system, he had music classes under a man named Ernst Otto. Ernst Otto is a fairly well-known uh, music teacher in the Davenport school system and in the history of Davenport schools and shaping uh, the music department here in Davenport. Uh, he was the first supervisor of the music department, and so he actually was the one that brought music to the Davenport schools in the late 1800s. And so if it wasn't for Otto, uh, Bix probably wouldn't have had very many music classes in school. During that time, Otto would teach every, every kid uh, once every two weeks in each of the classes going up, and then he was in charge of the orchestra in high school. And so Bix had a lot of years of learning music and different tunes from Otto. Uh, both Otto and Grady were very prominent 
uh, tutors and active musicians in the community. They both had their own orchestras and bands they played in, and they played professionally uh, throughout the community while on top of teaching kids all every day. Uh, Otto is also known for composing a number of important things like the song Our Davenport and the Mississippi Valley Fair and Exposition March. Uh, those were commonly used quite often uh, throughout that period of time. Uh, later in life, Otto even encouraged Bix to help get his union card, which is a little important uh, to talk about in a bit. So as a kid growing up uh, who loves music, uh, obviously Bix would have to have gone to a few different places. So knowing back then uh, a number of places that Bix liked and in other places that had music on top of the 500 to 1,000 different bars, um, Bix obviously wasn't going to any of those. He uh, was still a kid. So we have the Cole Ballroom. Uh, originally, it was the Sanger Fest Hall. Uh, this was actually built, uh, and it's still standing today. The original structure was wood, and it burned down in a fire. And the one that we have today is the, uh, the one that uh, is still standing since, I believe, the 1920s. Uh, the Sanger Fest Hall originally brought Germans from all over the Midwest to the Quad Cities. And it actually, at that point, it was one of the largest congregations of Germans uh, in the entire country uh, for one special music event. And so uh, going back on a lot of the German immigrants, they brought a lot of these music programs here. Uh, they built venues, and then they constantly were playing music. Uh, the Cole Ballroom was one of Vix's favorite places. He would actually uh, go there anytime he had money to uh, get the admission. And if he didn't have admission and his friends wanted to still listen to the music, he would actually stand outside the window and listen to the bands play. And so Bix was always there, listen to new bands. Uh, there's Schusen Park, um, another kind of a music park kind of thing that uh, still kind of stands today. Uh, I believe they still do a few things out there as well. Um, the photo in the, the top middle there, uh, that's actually Ernst Otto's orchestra playing at Schusen Park. Uh, that place was another big German attraction. Uh, people went out there on the weekends uh, to hang out, go to different music park rides and listen to music. Uh, Bix and his family would have been out there quite often as well. We also have the Capitol Theater and Terrace Gardens. Uh, the theater uh, hosted a, a large orchestra and the Terrace Gardens was a club that uh, was, um, if you're actually downtown and you go by the call building, uh, there, people call it the stairway to nowhere. It kind of just goes straight down. Um, that's where that Terrace Gardens used to be. Uh, that place, uh, Bix actually was hired a few times to play down there at that club. We have Danceland Ballroom. Bix had played there a number of times. Uh, most famously, it was when uh, the King of Jazz, Paul Whiteman played there. Uh, Bix was invited on stage to play uh, during that performance. And this was later in his career uh, after he had already became the musician that everyone knew him. Uh, Danceland's still operating today. Uh, that still does dance classes, different events, uh, music, things like that. We also have the Black Hawk Hotel. Um, while the hotel wasn't a big thing of Bix as his child, um, later in his life, he actually hung out there quite often when he was in Davenport and he would even play there uh, at different performances. Uh, we have the Harson Art Garden and Casino Movie Theaters. So growing up, Bix loved going to the silent films. It wasn't because of the films, it was actually because of the music. So Bix would actually go there, uh, listen to the music with his friends. And when they got done with the movie, they go to his grandparents' house and Bix would then play all of their favorite songs that they heard during the movie uh, after hearing them just once. And so he did that growing up and then later he got a job uh, filling in for the uh, players there. And the piano players there actually even invited him to a few different band gigs uh, when he was in high school. So he actually got a few gigs out of knowing personally the people that worked there. We also have the Peterson Memorial Band Show. Uh, Bix didn't really play there, but this is a place uh, that's still used today down by the river uh, where music would be playing all the time and you can hear it from all the way downtown. Uh, Bix didn't live too far away from downtown and so he would have heard music being played anywhere uh, downtown outside. And usually he, it was known that he would uh, run down there and listen to live music. And then the, we finally have the outing club. Uh, the Beiderbeck family were big proponents of the outing club. At the outing club, they did sports, uh, did other events, a lot of music events. Bix would actually play piano at the outing club every so often. And so that was a, a time for, for Bix to, to continue playing. Now, we've talked a little bit about 
everything else uh, outside of the Mississippi River. Now, one of the most important parts of Davenport, I think people like to say, is the Mississippi River. Um, even more importantly, was the music on the river. So in the Quad Cities at the time and all up and down the river, uh, we had those steamboats that would go up and down carrying manufacturing goods, but also as kind of a form of entertainment. Uh, the one in the area was owned by Captain Joe, Joe Streckfuss. He owned an entire fleet of riverboats uh, during this period of time that they would do day and night excursions up and down the Quad Cities area. And so Streckfuss would uh, bring on bands from all over the country that are traveling up the river. A lot of the bands, what they would do is they'd start up in Minnesota or all the way down in uh, Louisiana, and they would be hopping on boats as they go up and down. Uh, and so he was kind of coined as the guy who brought Dixieland, uh, the type of music that Bix fell in love with in high school, to the Quad Cities. Now, he didn't just bring Dixieland, he also provided a lot of jobs for local musicians. Uh, While well, Streckfuss brought bands like, uh, like Fate Myra Bell uh, and then Charlie Creeth, and, and a number of many other musicians. He also provided the type of jobs for a lot of budding musicians who got their start actually on these excursion boats. Uh, these excursion boats were very, uh, very tough to work on. Uh, the type of work that they did was they would be instructed to work two performances a day. They would do a lunch excursion. Uh, so they would be playing for about two or three hours and then they'd get back on for dinner and they'd be playing anywhere from like six or seven to midnight sometimes. Uh, Shrekfest specifically was very hard, and he said that the only way that people got their money's worth was if they were uh, dancing until they couldn't dance anymore. And so the bands were knowing when they got told that they were playing for these boats, they had to play until everyone was done dancing. Uh, and so uh, famously, he was the kind of guy that made a lot of musicians' careers. Uh, after moving on from a lot of these excursion boats, they went on to be quite quite famous. One of the most famous stories is Streckfuss actually kicked off a uh, poor shy idiot from his boat and a couple of years later he became uh, the loudest most boisterous musician in the country uh, named Louis Armstrong. Bix actually met Louis Armstrong on one of these excursion boats when Louis was playing in 1919 uh, in the Quad Cities. Uh, Bix would end up actually forming a very close friendship with him in Chicago just a few years later. Bix played on the riverboats uh, very, for a very short time, um, and he actually got kicked off as well uh, by Shrekfist for not having his union card. Uh, getting back to the whole union card thing, uh, Bix was able to get one in piano, uh, but he didn't get one for cornet. And so he got kicked off the boat because he didn't have his cornet union card. And the reason for it is because uh, in Iowa back then, the union cards had a test where you had to play sheet music. And Bix uh, never really learned sheet music. Uh, he could play competently with sheet music on the piano because he had uh, instruction early on by, by Grady and his mother. But uh, cornet, he was self-taught completely. And so he couldn't play any jazz uh, with sheet music. And that actually persisted most of his career. Um, and so uh, the fun story with Bix in this is that uh, him and the few musicians actually got on a boat that they rented uh, after getting kicked off chased it down about two miles south of the Quad Cities. And uh, Bix stood up and played the cornet right outside the side of the boat. And it was said that the band that was playing stopped what they're doing. All of the people on the boat stopped what they're doing. And they all went to the side of the boat and listened to Bix play uh, this impromptu set. Uh, and that was something that everyone said kind of made their night for that night because it was one of the best impromptu performances they've ever seen. A uh, big important thing to really note in, in general is the amount of connections Bix made uh, with these boats. He would go onto the boats when he could. The bands who played on the boats also sometimes played locally in some of the other locations like the Cold Ballroom. And Bix would meet a band. Uh, when a band played, he would actually interject himself and talk to them and try to get himself to you know play for a couple songs here and there, whether it's on the piano or the cornet. And that actually formed a lot of very close friendships he had when he moved on to the rest of his career. Uh, because a lot of these musicians were in Chicago when Bix actually started his professional career in Chicago. So 
I hope that this kind of helps a lot of people understand a little bit about VIX and a little bit about Davenport. Uh, the big question is, does Davenport provide a good location for a musician like VIX? Um, for me, I think yes, but also it's really hard to tell. Uh, Bix was, for all intents and purposes, a, a savant. He was a great musician, uh, and he probably would have been able to be a good musician almost anywhere. But the thing that I noticed seeing his life as a kid growing up and all the opportunities he had, uh, Davenport was a place where musicians thrived back in the 1920s. They still thrive today. We have a lot of great local musicians. And because of that and the river and all of these connections, uh, Davenport kind of is the place where a lot of really good music comes. Um, I know people who grown up here, uh, they, they know that every weekend there's probably live music. And if you wanted something to do, you just look up, you know, what, what place is having a band play. Uh, and so the big thing I, I think was Bix was in a family and a community that supported the arts and they supported music. Uh, and because of that, as a you know, budding musician who had uh, a very heavy interest in playing music, well, he was fostered in a way where uh, he definitely got that chance and that yeah. opportunity. Um, there's a lot of people who have gifts like Bix who don't really uh, pursue okay. them later like past you know, high school. Uh, and so I, I have a feeling that maybe Bix might not have been who he was if he, if he wasn't encouraged so much and he didn't have that opportunity. Um, before I you know, allow for questions, I, mean, I, I, I want to you know, thank a few people, obviously the, uh, the public library for Maybe letting me this, talk in this conversation with everyone. Um, uh, the Davenport oh. School Museum, they helped me quite a bit for Ernst Otto and Charles Grady. Um, they're two important figures that aren't very well known in the community, um, but they helped quite often uh, with young musicians uh, getting their start uh, in high school. Um, the Upper Mississippi Valley Digital Image Archive, a lot of the photos you guys saw came directly from that archive. It's a very nice public archive for people to see a lot of our history uh, as far back as the 1900s, very early 1900s. Um, I also want to mention that uh, if you like what you heard or you're interested to know more about Bix, the museum has a lot more to tell. Um, this was really only Bix's uh, childhood. Uh, he has a whole career you can learn about at our museum. Um, and then also, if you wanna to listen to some good music that's uh, similar to Bix's or inspired by Bix, uh, every year we have the Bix Fest uh, here in August. It's the first Saturday of that. So it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I think it's fourth, fifth, sixth. Um, I might be wrong on that, but uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, and come out, there's a lot of great musicians. Uh, some of them are local. They grew up listening to Bix and uh, it wasn't, if it wasn't for their teachers here, they wouldn't be who they were. Um, and they play a lot of great music, a lot of nationally known bands. And uh, it's, it's actually a very fun, thriving uh, community of music, uh, all inspired by Bix, uh, honoring his legacy. So uh, without further ado, I have time for questions. <laughs>